I've always wanted to have a new idea. And so, you know, I like a new idea and I want to, I don't want I want to nurture it as long as possible. And if someone can give me actionable criticism, that's why I think I was trying to say earlier when I was kind of like stuck for words, give me actionable criticism, you know, it's wrong. Okay. Why is it wrong? You say, oh, it doesn't, your, your equation's incorrect for this, or your method is wrong. And then so if it, and so what I try and do is get enough criticism um, from people to then triangulate and go back. And I've been very fortunate in my life that I've got great colleagues, great collaborators, funders, mentors, and people that will take the time to say, you're wrong because. Hello, everyone. I want to video record this message because it looks like um, some of the criticisms we have um, made to assembly theory haven't been answered by the senior authors of uh, assembly theory, even when they are very well known among um, other people and they are taken as very serious criticisms. But it looks like if they hadn't been made um, according to the senior authors. Uh, Lee Cronin says that he's making all these bold claims to make progress in science, that that's the way science works. I don't think it is because making unfounded, clearly wrong um, statements uh, damages science because it damages the credibility of scientists. To begin with, um, Lee Cronin says, for example, that his assembly index is not a compression algorithm and that compression is completely different. Assembly index, according to him, looks at how an object may have causally been generated, been lecturing for many years, including at the Santa Fe Institute on how Kolmogorov complexity is a measure of causality. The frustration I've had with with looking at life through this kind of information theory is it doesn't take into account causation. So the main difference between yeah. assembly theory and all these complexity measures is there's no causal chain. Start here, let's just take abracadabra. I'm gonna give you the letter A, B, C, D, and R. Please make abracadabra on a graph, a graph by using the letters one at a, you, going one at a time and you can reuse any memory on the graph. So you go A, B, R, A. So you make abra and when you go on, you're like, you've got abra on that graph, you've made it, you somehow have a memory of abra and then you go down and you make abra ka and you're like, oh, I've made the abra before. I don't need to spell it out again, I just add it on. So it's not compression like Hoffman encoding. It is actually built, okay, uh, from an understanding you have an object at a beginning and you do things and events happen and there is a memory trapped on that line. And that is assembly theory, it's not hard. So you can Google LZ or, or C77 for Lempev Civ. And you're going to see that it does exactly the same. Very widely now, it's known as the LZ77 method. We thought it might be a good idea to revisit the topic of uh, text compression, which was visited for the first time in the original compression video on the Computer File channel. What a typical LZ compressor will do is it will work its way through all of the text that you need to compress and we'll actually look for sequences of characters that recur over and over again. And we'll attempt to reuse them as much as it possibly can. Here we've got the word computer, eight characters. But the compressor could remember that it has seen that string of characters already as a subset of the string computer file. And you can even Google the same word that they like to use abracadabra that's their favorite example and you can see that actually this is a homework assignment for any computer scientist um, undergrad to implement some sort of um, automaton to implement a compression algorithm like lc77 and it is exactly the same ex example that Cronin and walker give in their many papers we already think we can do assembly theory on language and not only that wouldn't it be great if we can so the 
if we can figure out how under pressure language is going to evolve and be more efficient. And when I say it is, it is the same, I mean exactly the same step by step. Okay? So it is about traversing a piece of data, usually a string. You go from one side to the other one, looking for every letter. And it can, it can be anything else. It doesn't have to be a letter, obviously. So this algorithm is used, for example, a version of this algorithm is behind algorithms like GZIP that everybody uses to compress, compress anything, compress images, compress sound, video, anything. So you can feed a compression algorithm anything. LC77 basically traverses a string, looks for repetitions and replaces those repetitions by pointers so that it can be replaced. Um, and, and we know that that object has been repeated before. So basically it counts the number of copies what the assembly index is supposed to do and does it exactly the same as LZ77. Greg, the world is complex. I want to- You bet it is. <laughs> I want to understand the world and so I got to understand complexity. You've come at this problem very differently. You talk about algorithmic information theory and you've created this concept of omega that really has had some significant impact on how we think about complexity. So um, in other words, the way I would put it, using uh, my area, which I call algorithmic information theory, is understanding is compression. This is my big slogan. Understanding is compression. To understand is to compress. Now let me explain what I mean. I'm talking about understanding in physics. It seems to me that the most important discovery since Gödel was the discovery by Chaitin, Solomonoff, and Kolmogorov of a concept called algorithmic probability, which is the fundamental new theory of how to make predictions given a collection of experiences. And uh, this is a beautiful theory. Everybody should learn it. And, but it's got one problem, which is that you can't actually calculate what this theory predicts, because it's too hard and uh, requires an infinite amount of work. Uh, however, it should be possible to make practical approximations to the Chaitin, Kolmogorov, Solomonoff theory uh, that will make better predictions than anything we have today. And everybody should learn all about that and spend the rest of their lives working on it. Now, having established that the assembly index is basically a compression algorithm, and basically means that assembly theory collapses completely in an approximation of algorithmic complexity. This is, now there's an, in, a new thing we've introduced called assembly depth. Hmm. And assem assembly depth can be lower than the assembly index for a molecule when they're cooperating together because exactly this parallel processing is going on. Mm -hmm. And my team have been working this out in the last few weeks because we're looking at what compromises does nature need to make when it's making molecules in a cell? And I, I wonder if, you know, I, I'm maybe like, well, I'm always leaping out of um, my competence. <laughs> so that tells you about the depth of that object in time. Mm -hmm. Well, is that we've just mapped the tree of life using assembly theory, because mm -hmm. everyone said, oh, that you can't do anything in biology. So the tree of life is basically um, tracing back the history of life on Earth for all the different species going back, what, who evolved from what. Something I was completely surprised about is that now Lee Cronin said that he believes that it's going to turn out that assembly theory is going to be a superset of algorithmic information theory. I think that we're going to show that AIT is a very important subset of assembly theory. That makes absolutely no sense. It is actually the other way around, and I've been saying it for years. So assembly theory is what is called a resource-bounded measure of complexity, and it approximates cosmograph complexity. It is called resource-bounded because basically what you do is to, re to constrain the resources space or time so that you can always have an answer back. And that is because they rightly say that cosmograph complexity is not fully computable. They say it is uncomputable, but it's actually technically more correct to say it is semi-computable because you can always approximate it. But if you always want your algorithm to return with a 
with an answer because the original algorithm may not always come back with the answer because it is semi-computable. Then you restrict restrict the resources, time or space, just exactly as assembly index is doing. They are restricting their measure to only count the number of copies of, of something. Um, because that problem is very simple, you guarantee that you can always come back with the answer. It is just about seeing repetitions in a piece of data. I think that we're going to show that AIT is a very important subset of assembly theory. An assembly index is not a superset of algorithmic information theory. It's actually a subset as a resource-bounded approximation to code more of complexity. Furthermore, assembly index is not even very powerful. Shannon entropy is a quintessential um, function for counting copies based on a probability distribution. That means that some sort of prior knowledge on how many copies you have seen before, and you adapt your function to how many new copies you see in the future. And channel entropy is also a subset of called more of complexity because it is also some sort of approximation. So something that has low channel entropy means that also has low algorithmic complexity or low Kolmogorov complexity. But something that has high Shannon entropy doesn't necessarily have high Kolmogorov complexity because there could be many more things that just copies or simple copies of a piece of data. There could be reversions. There could be all sorts of things that are related to causality because you always have some sort of a small piece of data that you transform over time. And then you keep track of all those transformations. And that's actually the uh, definition of Kolmogorov of complexity. And that's why I, I have been claiming for almost 10 years that actually Kolmogorov of complexity is deeply related to causality, not assembly index, because assembly index is very lousy connected to causality because it only counts copies of things. And actually, before I thought it was doing something much more interesting, which is nested copies, but it is not even doing that. It is just simple straightforward copies what is counting and turns out to be actually that algorithm that i'm talking about lampet sif 77 and again you can just google it and you're going to see on the screen that it's actually incredibly simple and exactly the same step by step that assembly in the authors don't seem to understand um, that it is exactly the same it is indistinguishable from column of complexity and algorithmic information theory the shortest path then says allows you to say oh this object wasn't just created randomly there was a process there's also this connection between the theory and the methods the theory is basically just putting all these ideas ideas from algorithmic information theory together but the method is actually something simpler than channel entropy that was invented like 60 years ago the same lamp of sieve was invented in 1977 that's where the 77 comes from so these measures have been used for compression algorithms, exactly the same method, and even on bi biologically and chemical data. And actually, we did it ourselves almost five, five years before Cronin and Walker. Uh, they say that their most uh, impressive result is that they were able to separate organic from inorganic compounds. We did it ourselves five years before in the published papers in processing information letters. We didn't make so much noise because we don't like to make uh, unfounded um, claims. What we found before is actually that it's very easy to separate these categories, but pretty much you can take any representation of the data, um, name it nomenclature or uh, molecular distance matrices that are very similar to the uh, mass spectra data that they use for the paper. And we showed that we were able to separate uh, the organic from inorganic uh, compounds. And actually we did it on a very comprehensive database. So Crony always comes back saying, oh, NASA gave us this uh, handful of um, compounds that we didn't know what they were about and we were able to classify them correctly. But also NASA gave us, I think, five samples mm -hmm. and they wouldn't tell us what they are. They said, no, we don't believe you can get this to work. Mm -hmm. And they really, you know, they gave us some super complex samples and we gave them back to NASA and they're like, oh gosh, yep, dead living, dead, living. You got it. That is not a very good proof because actually we did it on um, 13,000 compounds, in, if I'm not mistaken. So basically we took all the compounds that we found in our repository and we showed exhaustively and systematically that we were able to separate organic from non-organic. Now he claims that um, it is uh, 
different because they are using physical data. What they mean by that is that they took uh, these uh, mass spectral matrices, which is just data, so it has almost no difference to any other, and fed it to their algorithm. So we replicated the same in our criticism paper, and we show that actually any other statistical measure, including channel entropy and convention algorithms, could reproduce their results and even outperform them with some of them a little bit more sophisticated measures, some of which we have uh, proposed ourselves before. And that's because the world has moved on 50 years ago from uh, simplistic approaches to life or classification like uh, assembly index. We found very early that just counting the number of copies was very limited. Imagine you are just finding, for example, a protein that turns out to be reversed that you you are reading in the reverse order, you would miss it as a copy, right? So we found ways to actually do much better with uh, more sophisticated uh, measures that are equally computable. Another thing that um, Cronin and Walker say, always say is that more of complexity requires a Turing machine. That makes absolutely no sense. It's like saying that because they measure and they perform all, all their calculations on a MacBook Pro, their measure requires a, an Apple computer. That's exactly the same kind of argument that they are using when saying that code more of complexity requires a Turing machine. And that basically speaks how unqualified they are to actually try to be making any of these contributions. Honestly, I don't think they have any idea of what a compression algorithm is when they say that, for example, a compression algorithm has instantaneous access to the memory and that's the way it compresses things one big kind of um uh um kind of misunderstanding is assembly theory is telling you about how compressed the object is that's not right it's a how much information is required on a chain of events because the nice mm -hmm. thing is if in when you do compression in computer science, well, we're wandering a bit here, but it's kind of worth wondering, I think. In you you um, assume you have instantaneous access to all the information in the memory. Yeah. In assembly theory, you say no. LC77 or GZIP work exactly the same assembly index. They traverse the object as they do, counting for copies exactly step by step. There's absolutely no difference. Um, identical copies, you can count them. And then you fragment them and you count the number of fragments. The argument about the Turing machine also immediately tells that they have no idea where is algorithmic complexity, unfortunately. I am a chemist. I also do computer science in my spare time, a little bit of robotics, wannabe physicist, wannabe math mathematician. But I'm an amateur philosopher. Oh, I think this is a copy number. The same string is coming again, again, again. I, kept, I couldn't do the math. Mm -hmm. And I can understand that people don't know some things and, and sometimes one may make mistakes uh, out of ignorance, but when people tell you you are mistaken and have the arguments and even have written a paper to show you that you are doing something wrong, you have to update your approach. And, and if you don't want to be open and say, okay, I was wrong, at least uh, stop saying what you were saying before and try something different. But here is not the case. They basically double down and keep telling that now this is a theory unifies biology and physics based on a 50 year old compression algorithm that they are not willing to accept there is a compression algorithm and therefore there is exactly algorithmic information theory, a, a very rudimentary version of Kolmogorov and algorithmic information theory. How is assembly theory or maybe assembly index different from Kolmogorov complexity? So for people who don't know, Kolmogorov complexity of an object is the length of a shortest computer program that produces the object as output. Yeah, I, I, I seem to, there seems to be a disconnect between the computational approach. To, so yeah, so a Kolmogorov measure requires a Turing machine, mm -hmm. requires a computer.
Um, another argument that they make is, um, as I was saying, they are applying this to physical data, the mass spectral data. We did it ourselves with other algorithms and we got the same results. And as I said, we have done it on different representations of the same data and we get the same results. So when you are claiming that you have done something novel, you have to show that either the methodology or the data is different, but when you can reproduce uh, exactly the same results with any representations of data and any other uh, index that has been proposed before, obviously the claims about novelty are difficult to understand. Well, what about the criticism of you're just putting a bunch of sexy names on something that's already obvious? Um, yeah, that's really good. So, so um, the assembly index of a molecule is not obvious. No one had measured it before. It is not the first time that has been applied to chemical data. We did it several years before showing the same results. We didn't do it on mass spectral data, but after the paper, we did it and we reproduced the results with all the other measures that we had already announced that and reported that we're able to separate organic from non-organic data. A lot of the arguments we got, some people said, oh, it's rubbish. Oh, by the way, I had this idea 20 years before. Mm -hmm. I was like, which one? Mm -hmm. if, is it your, the rubbish part or the really revolutionary part? So no new ideas in the theory side because they are indistinguishable from algorithmic information theory that has been asking about uh, mi minimal pathways and number of steps for the causal description and memory embedded in an object, exactly the same that assembly theory claims to be about. You can assume that most of the objects in the universe are built in the shortest, in the most efficient way. The, the, so, Big leap I just took there. Mm -hmm. So the shortest path tells us something super interesting about the minimal amount of uh, information required. The method is exactly a compression algorithm that has a name and was introduced almost 50 years ago. And the application is not novel and taking any data representation and basically any weak statistical index reproduces that data. So. Really, we don't know what is left to talk about. One minor thing that people are saying that perhaps is their contribution is this idea of a cutoff value, a threshold over which if you have so many copies, you are kind of alive or are possibly a living system. That is not true either because if that is true, that is true also for all the indexes that we tested um, before and they were able to separate the same data. So instead of talking about just 15 um, copies, you can just have a ratio of uh, compressibility or a minimum value of Shannon entropy. So the threshold value is really not important because it's not unique. But even if it were, it doesn't say much because non-organic and organic doesn't mean life or non-life. This is a very limited, narrow-minded definition of life that even a crystal can challenge. So I'm really, really sorry to say I don't find anything, any substance in assembly theory. And I'm just surprised of, of um, how the senior authors have been introducing what they claim are new ideas that seem to only serve um, self-promotion. Um, so really, really difficult to understand where their uh, motivation and how as scientists, they, they cannot take criticism seriously, answer the questions, why they disregarded the research that has been done before, including our own paper, where we show that we could separate organic from non-organic compounds. Can they publicly say and acknowledge first that they are using a compression algorithm that there's no requirement of our Turing machine for a government of complexity other than they don't require a Dell computer to run their um, measure. Uh, 
and ju just answer these questions. Uh, Cronin comes out always saying that there's no dispute on the, the science. We're, we're, it, it is about asking the question and bringing those new disciplines together. And with that Nature paper, you could see the collision of all the disciplines. I knew something interesting was going on because everyone's like, what do you mean, th th arguing about words and no one's disputing the science. It is almost like us lighting 24 seven. They don't go into detail. They don't answer the specific questions, the, the specific challenges. And they just keep saying, we may be wrong, but actually we are unifying biology and physics and redefining life with no basis. You know, it has been criticized quite a bit, the paper. Uh, what has been some criticism that you found most powerful, like that you can understand and can you explain it? The Yes, the most exciting criticism came from the evolutionary biologists telling me that they thought that that uh, it, it origin of life was a solved problem. And I was like, whoa, we're really on to something. One other argument by the authors, especially Lee Cronin, is that people crit that criticizes assembly theory are jealous. I'm not jealous, I'm actually embarrassed. I'm embarrassed by them. People mi misunderstand publication as well. Some of the people have said, how dare this be published in Nature? Mm -hmm. This is, you know, how, what a terrible journal. And, and, I, and it really, and I watched said to people, look, this is a brand new idea that's not only potentially going to change the way we look at um, biology, it's going to change the way we look at the universe. And everyone's like saying, how dare you? How dare you be so grandiose? I'm like, no, 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 this is not hype. We're not, we're not like saying we've invented some, um, I don't know, we've discovered an alien in a closet somewhere just for hype. We genuinely mean this to genuinely have the impact or ask the question. And the way people jumped on that was a really bad precedent for young people who want to actually do something new because this makes a bold claim. And the chances are that it's not correct. But what I wanted to do is a couple of things is I wanted to make a bold claim that was precise and testable and correctable, not a woolly, another woolly information in biology argument, information, Turing machine, blah, 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 blah. A concrete series of statements that can be falsified mm -hmm. and explored, and either the theory could be destroyed or built upon. Why fraud? Mm -hmm. And they just said, just because. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, and so, so, and, the, and I could not convince the editor in this case. The editor was just so pissed off because they see it as like a kind of, a, you know, a, 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 you're wasting my time. And I would not give up huh, they can't tell me why I'm wrong. I've always wanted to have a new idea. And so, you know, I like a new idea and I want to, I don't want I want to nurture it as long as possible. In movies like Tron or The Matrix, reality is composed of computer code, a digital realm perceivable to the enlightened. What if our understanding of the natural world could be similarly seen and transformed? Algorithmic information dynamics is a new theoretical and practical framework for exploring the world as if seeing the world through NEO's digitally enhanced eyes. Using these tools, one can either apply perturbations to the digital model make hypotheses of what may happen in the real world, and anticipate changes that unveil causal chains of cause and effect. Or, one can apply the perturbation to the physical world, see how the digital hypothesis of that perturbation changes the digital model, and improve the correspondence to the underlying hypothesized mechanistic explanation. Scientists can move back and forth between the real world and software space, to understand what happens behind each interaction, where each thing comes from, and how the mechanistic model works. As in The Matrix, where Neo manipulated digital reality, the theory adjusts to new computable models derived from the tools provided 
and reveals possible underlying rules of dynamical systems and networks of interconnected cause and effect chains. Algorithmic Information Dynamics, published by Cambridge University Press, is a fundamental new way to see and explore the world, a hitchhiker's handbook for scientists and philosophers alike to deconvolute the complexities of reality. For a long time, the way in which simple animals behave has been poorly understood. For example, it has been long thought that insects are unsophisticated. They do not process much information, they take decisions at random, and react to their environment in a very instinctive way without using any brain power. However, a group of scholars from Cambridge, Oxford, and Sheffield in the UK, and from Kost in Saudi Arabia, are generating new insights using tools based on an approach to artificial general intelligence called algorithmic information dynamics that are capable of capturing and explaining the complexity of behavioral patterns resulting from human or animal decision-making. The results, for the first time, quantify previous claims regarding the capabilities of ants to communicate instructions to find food in a maze, confirming that food in locations that require more complex instructions to find do take longer to communicate. Validated that insects like fruit flies do use their small brain power to make decisions, even in the absence of external stimuli, in line with recent experimental research. And showed that some animals, such as rats, can outsmart predators by engaging in apparent random behavior on purpose as a strategy. The results show that ostensibly random strategies are in fact not truly random, but instead may result from intelligent thought, as they display higher computational content than truly random. Ultimately, these results can find applications in the design of new cognitive strategies to improve applications of artificial intelligence, including generative AI and robotics or develop artificial general intelligence, mimicking natural intelligence from insects to humans. We have been transmitting messages to space for decades, ever since the invention of electromagnetic communication. And in the 1970s, we even did so on purpose. The Arecibo message was a two-dimensional image sent as a one-dimensional stream of electromagnetic pulses that contained information about our ways of living, our genetic components, our location in the galaxy, and more. But could it really be possible that intelligent beings exist that can receive our messages, decode, and understand them? They would have needed to guess that such one-dimensional message was actually meant to be a two-dimensional image. To address these questions, Scientists have thought deeply about interstellar communication. They've been asking what messages should be sent, how should they be sent, and how might the receiver distinguish between an actual purpose-sent message and space noise. This work has led to important breakthroughs. Previous work has shown that tools developed in the field of algorithmic information theory can be used to characterize complex objects from random and simple, and even distinguish between objects produced by intelligent life and those produced by nature. And more recent work has advanced our understanding even further. Recently, a team of scientists led by a Cambridge and Oxford researcher has found that in non-random data, information encodes some of its physical properties, even in the face of significant noise. And that random perturbations can unveil the message structure even before knowing anything about the content of the message. For example, one type of these perturbations is playing with the length and height of these images, even before knowing that it's a two-dimensional image or anything about their lengths, by traversing dimensions from lower to higher, starting from one dimension, then two, three, and so on. Turns out that the closer to the dimension in which the message was originally coded, if it was causally generated and not the result of randomness, it will have lower complexity and higher information content as opposed to look random in any configuration. The original embedded configuration, or a similar symmetric one, will display the lowest complexity and highest content. These advancements raise the likelihood that tools from the field of algorithmic information dynamics 
could be used to identify and possibly decode messages from afar. Moreover, they show that aliens with a basic understanding of the same fundamental mathematics would have some chance at understanding what we send them. And they increase our chances at understanding messages from alien sources, even if the message comes deconstructed and embedded in a different form, without information about its dimensions and proportions. This work has built a new connection between syntax and semantics that may help find bio and techno signatures in the universe. And it advances a theoretical and practical framework that relates information, complexity, geometry, and semantics that can be extended to multiple uses in cryptography and information theory.